there's no good scientific evidence that God exists. There's no reason to think the Bible is true. If he was God, he didn't have to ruin the guy's herd. That didn't sound very loving to me. Across these different religions, you find all of these common threads. Why can't I compare them? Thank you so much for tuning in again. I'm Melissa and this is Flourishing Faith. And today we're gonna to be responding to the atheist debates made by Sean McDowell in this YouTube video that I found. So I'm gonna watch the video along with you guys and I'm gonna pause throughout the thing and um, say sort of some thoughts that I have found while watching that. And also, I have done tons of research. So this isn't just like my willy-nilly opinion. I have done research. Sean McDowell's story is very identical to Lee Strobel's story. And it basically is that he wanted to disprove Christianity, but ended up believing in Christianity because there wasn't enough evidence to prove that God wasn't real. And so it kind of led him that way. And Lee Strobel, he is a guy who had a movie made after him, which is actually called The Case for Christ, which is such an amazing movie. I highly recommend it. He is a Christian professor and he teaches everywhere about Christianity and atheists give him all these arguments that they have and so he is pretending to be an atheist. Okay, let's get into it. I'm bringing my friend Sean up to speak today. He's got his PhD in philosophy and he teaches out in California at UCLA and he had told me a while back that he was going to be here in Florida for a uh, convention of philosophy at UM, and I thought if you could come by and pretty much do what I do to you guys every week in apologetics class uh, and just press you on what you believe and why you believe it, uh, but this time it's not just going to be someone pretending. And so I hope you guys are up for that challenge. He's going to share some of his story with you and then also take a few questions from you guys. So as he's sharing his story, uh, have a few questions ready. Maybe Give a great round of applause for my friend Sean as he comes up. Hey, thanks for having me. This is a unique opportunity. So obviously I'm not going to go through the entire video because it's an hour and 12 minutes, but I'm going to pause periodically and fast forward some parts because some parts are a little mundane. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to my first point that I would like to point out. To make a long story short, after I started to read people of different worldviews, I came to the conclusion there's no good scientific evidence that God exists. There's no reason to think the Bible is true, let alone inspired. So here's the first thing I'd like to point out and sort of debunk because he said that there is no scientific evidence that the Bible is accurate. There is so, okay, I'm not being biased when I say this. I did so much research. I was like, hmm, is there scientific evidence that the Bible is accurate? Yes, there is. There is so piles on piles on piles of evidence. I will link my sources down below in the description box. There is there is literally a circle chart that shows the dates people were born, how long they lived, who overlapped each other, when things occurred. This Bible we have is so accurate. I mean, even if it wasn't inspired, like he said, you can't say that it isn't accurate. On to the next thing. I mean, there's far too many contradictions and errors and mistakes in the Bible. Okay, so that came quick. So he says that there are so many errors in the Bible. Now, I did so much research on this question because I this video has really um, pulled out the parts of Christianity that I was sort of like, I didn't really understand that much. But when he said that the Bible isn't accurate and there are so many inconsistencies, I took a deep dive and I researched, are there any contradictions in the Bible? Now, there are a lot of people, a lot of Christians even, that say that there are inconsistencies in the Bible. I believe this is untrue because, literally, I have looked up a list of all the inconsistencies in the Bible. I went through almost all of them, and I found the reason reasoning behind them. And so I also found many websites that told me the reason why, which is that there are misinterpretations, meaning the human, like the person reading it, misinterprets it as a mistake. Because there are many ways that the Bible can be confusing, but not incorrect. 
between the translations there could be a problem and so when there when you're translating from a different language that is very different from English and you try to translate it to English it's going to be a little weird <laughs> there I got that point done now on to the next one you like to talk about philosophical arguments correct so I would like to know what you think about the world and its creation as a whole philosophically and how the world, if it's so fine-tuned to its creation, how something bigger or outside didn't create So, one is the question of, say, the origin of the universe creation. Now, I don't think the universe was created. I don't believe in creation because that word implies a creator and a mind. That's the very thing I'm not convinced that actually exists. So, I actually think the data shows that while our universe had a beginning, when you look at string theory, you'll find what's called the multiverse. The multiverse, I think string theory points towards that reality. So our universe had a beginning, but I don't think the multiverse did. It's eternal and it's always been here. And there's reasons for that we could go into. Uh, fine tuning, if this were the only universe that existed, then I think we would be surprised that it happens to be so seemingly exquisitely fine-tuned to allow life. Now this point that Sean makes is actually a really good point and it took me a lot of time to understand. I have always said that isn't it amazing that we have like the perfect food and we have like the perfect amount of sunlight for us and his point against this that it was God who made it specifically for us is that we find ourselves in this situation and we can awe at it because we are here and so that's this is kind of like the puddle theory it's like water saying oh my goodness this hole was made perfectly for me but instead it is just the water filling and being perfect to the circumstance and so that is kind of what his argument is but what i would ask him is how come if we are created and this is just a mistake and this is just a um haphazard accident that we are here and we know everything here and we are accommodated here then why am i me here why am i here on earth on this place and why am i me this world isn't created whether that be this universe or the multiverse as a whole well i don't think the universe had a beginning okay so that part that he says well i don't think the universe had a beginning this is very incorrect there is evidence that there was a beginning of our universe and this is due to the fact that there is a center of our universe and our universe expands and um, constricts. And this evidence that there was a beginning point, which some might say is the Big Bang, which would not be bad for Christians to know that there is a Big Bang. But if there was a Big Bang, and that, that would have been the beginning of our universe, which proves that our universe is not eternal. A lot of scientists prove that there, that our universe is not eternal. And so there had to be a point of creation, which means there had to be a creator. God is eternal. Now this means that God never had a beginning and the universe isn't eternal, so there had to be a beginning. So this is sort of the logic that Christians follow, but atheists do not. Josephus was That's Jewish. Josephus mentions 33 people by the name of Jesus. 33 people. Have you read the Antiquities of the Jews? I have not read that yet. Okay, so listen. That's all right. I would encourage you to read it. It's like saying somebody referred to Mike or John today. Now this leads me to my fifth point, which is basically... If you were Josephus, you would have made clear that this Jesus that you were talking about was different from every other Jesus. If you were mentioning 35 Jesuses, you would make sure to make clear that one of them was performing miracles, was born in Bethlehem, had the last name Christ, and had disciples. So you, he wouldn't be one of those mundane 35 Jesuses that Josephus would have mentioned. Let's take, while we're talking, go ahead and pull your mask off. Then we. So this girl is going to ask him, where did the idea of consciousness come from? And so here's how Sean is going to answer that question. There are certain capacities for what are called emergent properties at the right level of complexity and diversity to emerge. So take, for example, hydrogen and oxygen. They're two physical molecules or elements. You put them together and you have water. 
Now, a new property emerges called wetness. It doesn't exist just in hydrogen, doesn't exist just in oxygen, but somehow when these two physical properties emerge, you ha- these two elements emerge, you have this new property develop out of it. I think the same is true when it comes to the emergence of consciousness. Now this point makes so much sense, and uh, this is scientifically based reality that two things coming together can form a new thing. But here's the problem with that. A, what two things were that? Because there is nothing in the universe that is like the consciousness of someone. Like, as you know, hydrogen and oxygen, they come together to form another thing, which is water. That is another physical thing. Now, this is very different from something and something, a material thing, two material physical things coming together to form this thing called consciousness, which is basically the reality of you looking through your eyes, knowing yourself. Also, there's another website that I found that um, I will link in the description box, and it basically proves with quantum theory, if anyone knows what that is, quantum theory basically has proven recently that there is consciousness after death, which is very, very good news. Where do you personally And where do you suggest others find vocational motivation? I don't think there's a God. I don't think there's a grand design. But as we look at this amazing story of evolutionary history, we have things like friendship. We have good food. We have knowledge. And I think as we look at human beings across different cultures, we find this common recognition that our lives can be purposeful even if there's no afterlife or they differ about God. This is the perspective of a lot of atheists, and this is how they um, view their life, and they view it as living an experience. If you ask someone, an atheist, what is the meaning of life, they will say, to experience. To summarize it, to experience. To basically experience love and feel the goodness of life and to give and to help others. Now, yeah, that's, that's good, but not good enough because there is something so much bigger about life. And when you ask a Christian, what is the meaning of life? Christians will say, ultimately, to glorify God. Now, atheists may be like, oh great, like that is, that's terrible. Like, why would I want to spend my life glorifying just another thing instead of living it? Well, Christians want to experience life to the fullest. And when you glorify God, it's already been proven, when you glorify something and you, you focus on something with all your energy, Christians are proven to be more happy and to experience more and be happier in life because they're glorifying a higher power. And so this this shows that the way to experience life, the way to experience and have the meaning of life fulfilled in your life is to glorify God. Nice to meet you. Um, okay, so you have said repeatedly throughout today that you believe in science. Yes? Uh, broadly, yes, sure. Broadly, okay, so we'll take that. Um, so I was wondering, when a trial or tribulation, per se, comes into your life, how do you explain the origin because of Because I embrace science as a means of knowing the world, doesn't mean I only embrace science as a means of knowing and experiencing the world. That's what's called scientism. I don't embrace scientism. I think it's a testable, powerful way that's given us medicine, communications, uh, transportation, etc. So when something like a pandemic hits, I don't go to the Bible. I turn to science because science has given us vaccines. Without a higher purpose and without a higher... Um, being helping you through and the idea that what you are going through is meant to be and has a good ending it must be really hard to endure um, when life throws you random trials because you feel like it is just random and it is just it like was picked on for you randomly by random chance but if you're a Christian who believes that God lets things happen to you and is for the better and when you believe in God things are for the better that the trials that you're going through they have a meaning to them 
And this makes a Christian stronger because someone who is going through life and they're like, I have the worst luck and things are randomly happening to me. Like, why is this happening to me? And that sort of grows anger in you and it makes a bad situation. But if you were a Christian, you would believe that, yes, I'm going through a hard time, but God is with me. I know there is a reason. And if all else fails, I will be going to heaven with the Lord and Savior. So it is a lot better to be a Christian in the circumstances of going through trials. Oh, good afternoon. Are you familiar with the Shroud of Turin? With the Shroud of Turin, yes. Um, could you explain why you believe that the Shroud of Turin is not physical evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yes, because the most recent carbon dating dates it to the Middle Ages. Okay, so I did some research on this, and also at the end of the video, Sean explains when he's his Christian self then, that when he said that shroud part where he said it was dated back not to the time where Jesus was alive, that they only carbon dated one section of the shroud, which has been proven to be a newer piece to it. But the original pieces of the shroud have not been carbon dated because they didn't want to ruin it. And expert daters, they um, say that, that they are 80 to 90 percent sure that the shroud is legitimate and real and it is an actual um, piece that shows us Jesus existed. But even if the shroud did for some reason be made after Jesus was dead and it was just an after fact artifact, um, this does not disprove Christianity at all. It was just a piece that we as Christians, we look at and we're like, wow, that is very cool. But it does not base our religion. If Jesus is God, he can cast out demons without sending them into a bunch of pigs. Who agrees with that? Let me see your hands. If Jesus is God, he can cast out demons without sending them into pigs. Who agrees with that? It's not very hard. And so given that he could have done something without harming the man's property, and he didn't, at least raises the questions of his loving actions towards that man. If you own those pigs, I think you'd have felt very differently. So basically, this is a story that happened in Matthew chapter 8, and it was when Jesus came to a new city, and he saw this demon-possessed person. And so he, he walked up to him, and the demons were so scared that were in the man, and they were like, they were pleading with Jesus, please, do not, do not kill us, just please let us go into those pigs. And so Jesus cast them out. He didn't send them into the pigs, but he cast them out of the man. And the demons ran into the big herd of pigs, which eventually ran into the lake or whatever and drowned themselves. Now, yeah, um, Jesus could have just um, made the demons go away and not go into the pigs. But here's the thing. Jesus wanted to make an impact on the pig herder. Now in this, um, Sean makes the point that if Jesus was so loving, then why would he kill the pig herder's pigs and, and just like walk away? If Jesus is God, why didn't he just make the demons disappear? Why did he have to let them go into the pigs? Well, you see, Jesus obviously was healing this demon-possessed man and he was then freed. And then the demons, they needed somewhere to go. Well, Jesus wasn't going to make them leave or die because Jesus needed them to go into the pigs because the pig herder needed to witness this and see the big impact and he needed to be set free from his job. Um, and he needed, he, after this, it says that the that the pig herder he went into the town saying oh my goodness the messiah is here the biggest sign happened and he was free from herding his pigs and the demons were gone now and so jesus had to do this this was a sequence that had to happen and jesus is so loving there's so many instances where jesus was loving jesus showed his love to the pig herder because now the pig herder believed that jesus was the son of god and now he also helped this demon possessed man and now i'm going to show the part where sean reveals himself as a christian and we're going to watch till the end and yeah. So I'm going to take the last 15 minutes and uh, tell you about what I really do. 
I'm not a philosophy professor. I'm not an atheist. I'm not an atheist. I actually teach at a Christian university in Southern California, a private school called Biola. And uh, I teach at a private Christian school part-time as well, high school Bible. Go. I, I want to make you think about a few things, all right? First off, don't answer this, but why don't you reflect in your heart a little bit, just personally. As a whole, how do you think you treated your atheist feels? Yes. The more I do this with people, here's how I find Christians respond. How many of you felt like maybe you're a little bit defensive, a little bit testy, a little bit upset? I, if you couldn't see it, I could see it in a lot of your eyes, by the way. Some of you are like, I'm ready for this guy to leave, which is okay. Um, here's one reason why I'm convinced we get a little bit defensive. Part of it is if we don't know what we believe and why we believe it, and somebody starts challenging us, what happens? We, we get defensive, right? So I think you should only be a Christian if you actually think that it's true. That's the best reason to be a Christian. Okay, so now that you saw the big reveal, um, I want to talk through a few things. The students made some really good points against the atheist, and the atheist made some really good points too. But with every point that was made, I was able to research and find the Christian reasoning for it. You can test and test and test the Bible and God and Christianity, and there will be this constant string of truth because Christianity is true. You won't be able to disprove Christianity. And in the end, it is not just a scientific thing, but you have to believe. Yes, anyone can be proved Christianity to, and they can totally like see the facts. They can be standing in front of God, and they can still reject. So you need the faith. You need faith in God and the love of Jesus and how he came and saved you from your sins. And so I think this video was so awesome. I'm so happy that this popped up on my suggested page. And I am so happy I got to review it and share some of my points. And I learned so much by having to dig deep and answer these questions and answer and debunk these things that the atheist was saying. Also, on the last point that Sean made when he was in the video, he was saying how as Christians, when we are encountered with an atheist and we have our thoughts opposed to, we kind of can get defensive. And I could tell that before I even knew, like when I was watching it the first time, I did not know that he was an undercover Christian. And so the whole time I was like getting defensive, I was like, no, no, no. And you could tell some of the students were getting defensive too. When you have your faith challenged by you and by like a different person don't get defensive be strong in your faith know rock solid why you believe what you believe and do your own research like you know this in your heart why you believe in god now comment down below if i should do this again this was so much fun and i hope this video wasn't too long for you guys and also comment down below if you like my new set my new position and um, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And share this video with anyone you'd like to, including atheists. Also, I would like to say that thank you to anyone. I have gotten a few donations from you wonderful people. And I thank you so much because it helps me get a good set. Because like right now, I have... Um, for a viewfinder, I have a mirror which is behind my phone, which is stacked on top of a garbage can and two bins. So yeah, it definitely helps when you guys donate and it is so awesome and I feel so blessed and God bless you guys who do that and you're so sweet. Oh my goodness. Thank you guys so much and bye!